So this is part two of the 33 inch tire trim kit. And I've prolonged putting the back portion on as I thought I'd be able to get away with it until I went with the high marks. However, I'll show you what a 33 inch tire with a zero offset will do. And I got pretty lucky. Most of the time, you can see the contact usually happens down in here. And when it catches here is when it causes damage. And if you take a close look, you can see where the rub is. Um, and I got lucky enough, it actually polished that uh, washer and bolt pretty good. Uh, but you can see it was just a sliding rub. It didn't quite catch in any instance. So whatever the configuration, where the axle sits right now, just so happens favors this side. And it doesn't quite do any major damage. However, taking a walk around to the other side... Uh, not so lucky and same instance you can see that the rub was there uh, it actually caught the bolt on this case here and pulled it completely out uh, but this is the typical damage that you're going to see uh, from a tire coming in contact with that bottom lip edge there so once it catches you'll hear it and it'll continue to rub and pull until it actually damages or pulls the entire fender flare off so uh, I was lucky enough it didn't actually catch the fender flare nothing has come off the top but that's what the trim kit was designed to alleviate was that front end uh, movement that catches that edge. So as you can see, the back edge, no issue. Uh, if you look around the top on contact, the zero offset makes for a little bit of a problem. And you can see a little bit of contact there. Sorry about the light. Uh, but very, very little. It just does so under maximum articulation. So that's what we'll be looking at today. Uh, I got the wheel and tire off and we'll get started. Two quick things. First and foremost, I'm assuming that you're using proper jack and jacking techniques. Uh, so make sure the car is properly supported. Number two, read the instruction guide. If you haven't, this is part two of a two part piece. So go back to the first video, but let's get started and pull the wheel and tire off and get right into this modification. The front of the fender has three screws and one retainer clip and the rear has one screw and one retainer clip. You're gonna to need to remove all of these to get the fender flare off. With the retaining clips and screws removed, just go to the back edge of the fender flare and give it a nice pull forward, and you'll find that the fender flare comes off with some easy force. As you get to the front edge though, there is a two-piece spat. Just make sure you give yourself enough room and kind of tip the fender flare down as you see here to work yourself around the metal so it doesn't catch. While you have a chance, it's a good idea to go ahead and clean up under the fender flare, but this will also make sure your tape sticks when you get the templates put on. Speaking of templates, it's time to go ahead and cut out our paper templates and line everything up. Read through them carefully. Look at the different cut lines as they're different for the ZR2 and the ZR2 Bison. Think about which ones you're going to need and make sure you follow the right lines. To get the inner fender liner off, you're going to have to remove about a dozen screws and three push pins, and that'll free up the inner liner. And then we're going to go ahead and pop it out. There's a couple different ways here, but basically fold the front end in, kind of pull and work your way around the entire fender well. Now I like to cut some pieces of tape and set those up so that when I set the template onto the appropriate little locator holes, uh, I have the tape handy to kind of lock it in place. So first thing, get the fold edges in, make sure that it sits in the way that it's supposed to, nice and flat against the body. And the tabs that we're folding in are actually meant to line up against the inner edge. So when you're laying out the template, again, make sure it's flat, make sure all of your holes that are supposed to be aligned to it align, and you can just in this case, you can see me using my finger to kind of find the center point. Uh, I like to do that and get them aligned. If I need to, I'll pull it back up and lay them both down so that they're nice and flat. And it's critical that it's nice and flat. If you have any bends inside of your template, it's going to change the curvature of your cut. And the cut is the most critical part here. So once you get everything locked in place and you're comfortable, put some tape down, lock it in so that you can create your actual cut line. And as you'll see here, what I'm going to be doing is locking in the position of the template and then as we get to the inside edge, it's gonna be about placing the tape on the inside of the cut line instead of the outside holding the actual template in place. So as you can see, I'm leaving the tape edge dangle so that we can put the second template on the bottom. Now this template does differ from the other one as it doesn't have an edge of the template that's gonna give us our cut line. This one, the continue cutting line runs right through the middle. So once we get everything lined up uh, and all of our reference points in, you're gonna to have to fold this one in half to determine where to cut. But this also provides us with two more quarter inch holes we're gonna drill, so pay attention to those. And really now is a good time to kind of do a reality check. So here's where I'll grab the bracket, place it on the inside edge and kind of just see how everything lines up. 
now that I'm comfortable with how everything's going to fit, I'm gonna start laying down my inner cut edge and this is basically putting the tape where the material I'm gonna remove is so I can take the template off. And once I get the template off, we're gonna lay down our actual reference line as our do not cut area following immediately after that. With the template removed, I can now straighten up my lines and be comfortable with where my cutting edge is going to be. And now I'm gonna lay down my second tape line, which is gonna be my do not cross line. So this is gonna butt right up to the edge of that original template line and is gonna remain on the vehicle while I do my cutting. So we're gonna remove the inside tape that I've just placed and this will be where the material that we're going to remove will be. Again, once I'm comfortable with where the uh, tape line is, I'm gonna remove those inner pieces uh, that I put down for my inside edge and I move right along to doing a test fit of the template again to make sure that my lines align perfectly and I'm completely comfortable with where I'm gonna cut. We only get one chance to cut it right and that's our next step. So let's just make sure that everything we're going to remove is exactly what we want to remove. So now that we've verified that our cut lines are good, we're ready to cut the fender. I'm gonna warn you guys here, this section is gonna play out a little long. It's about three minutes of real time and I've accelerated the cut process here by a little over 400% but I'm gonna let it play through. So if you've never seen the fender cut before, or you're not comfortable cutting metal and it's your first time, you can see the whole process. Uh, this is gonna go on for the next two minutes and 50 seconds. So in that time, I'm gonna talk about some of the things you'll run into, but also why I used a cutoff wheel and the other potential of using like a reciprocating saw instead. Uh, there are some other things I'll talk about as well. Uh, one of the reasons why I like to use air powered tools when cutting materials is you'll see here uh, as I cut into some of the material, there is two layers of metal. There's the outer thin sheet metal and there's a thicker inner fender that kind of winds up to it. As you go through that, you're gonna find that if you change the angle at all on a cutoff wheel, it might bind. If you have a high torque electric device, it actually might grab and walk the blade out and on top of the areas you don't wanna cut. The nice part about using kind of my double brace system with both hands and an air tool is that if I get to a point where it binds at the proper air pressure, it'll actually stall the blade and keep it from moving, at which point in time I can release the lever, pull the blade out and not cause any extra damage. So that's just my comfortable zone with an air tool and using the cutoff wheel. But there's still something you have to note with a cutoff wheel and that is it generates a lot of heat and friction as the blade surface contacts a lot of material at a high speed. Uh, whereas a, a reciprocating saw only has just the thickness of the blade, which is much smaller. So here you'll notice that I've left a nice 16th of an inch of material away from the final cut line. And there's two reasons. One, I'm not perfect. I might make an error. So I want to give me some uh, error of margin that I can sand off. But two, if you look closely at the material, especially the paint at the edge, that extra heat I was talking about will actually cause the paint to peel up. Now, I wanna make sure I, I remove that so that where I do put my sealant on the outside, it's gonna prevent any kind of moisture from getting in there and causing any rust or for a future delamination of the paint and the metal uh, that's been bonded before. So that's a little bit of something you have to watch out for and you'll see every once in a while, I might even use some compressed air if I see the heat building up. Uh, and that's also to clear my uh, visual line as some of the material starts to build up under the tape edge. So there are a couple things with using a cutoff wheel that you have to consider but that's really uh, why I chose this one because I'm pretty comfortable with that. Uh, but that being said, as you can see, as I'm getting through the material here, I've done two levels of cutting. Uh, there is the first level, again, that thinner material. And as I get into that secondary material, uh, I'm going into the deeper part second. And what that means is that I'll have a nice guideline being the top cut that'll keep the blade from walking away from where I want it to be and giving me the overall result I want, which is a nice even line all the way to the bottom. So once we get to the bottom, you'll notice the top is still in place and that's because the vertical line and the cross line, I didn't quite connect the two to make sure that when I got to the bottom edge and it was cutting the thicker material, it wouldn't cause the blade to bind and fling the material around. And as you can see, once it is cut, I'll go to the top and kind of wiggle the little joint loose. And here you can see the two thicknesses of material and what it looks like between the two. So this is what we're working with and this is what we're gonna clean up next. So a quick check with the bracket lets me know that my cut line is good and the holes are lining up and it's time to do that last bit of sanding. Like I said, with a cutoff wheel, I had to leave that 16th of an inch. So I'm gonna use a coarse circular sander with the air tool and take off a good majority of that material and come back with my detail file sander and work that area down, smooth that area down until I get the contour that lines up right up to my tape line. This is gonna take a little bit of time. And again, 
This is gonna be covered up by the fender flare, so how much time you spend here is just whatever makes you comfortable with yourself. Um, for me, I like to make sure that it looks clean. That's just the way I am. So I'm gonna spend some time here and make sure all the edges are completely deburred, as well as even with my tape line to make sure that I get the best possible fitment. Now, I will say uh, this is where the plastic will set against, so you do wanna make sure at least it's fairly flat so you get a good result when you mount the bracket up to it. So a quick check with my straight edge lets me know the bottom edge and the vertical edge are nice and flat and I'm ready to move on to the next step so I can pull the tape off and get ready to do my center punch and start drilling some holes. The first hole I'm going to do is for the side mount bracket and that's going to be an eighth inch pilot hole and then immediately following that with a quarter inch final hole and this will be for that side bolt and nut to go through. Once I get to the bottom, I'm going to do the same and do two eighth inch pilot holes. But as you go into a quarter inch drill bit and have the two different layers and the bottom one being the thinnest layer, you may find that the bit wants to bind. So what I like to do to make sure that everything lines up and the holes are there, I'll put the original pilot bit through the original hole, clamp the two surfaces together to make sure all the holes line up, and then drill through with my complete quarter inch drill, which will be for the final hole size. Uh, this will be something that you're going to want to clean up afterwards so spend a second here and get all the burrs off as you're going to want to put a spacer in between these and i'll show you that later now we're going to need to temporarily install that aev closeout bracket and this will be so that we can mark an area that we're going to have to cut off. So we'll use those three Allen head bolts followed by the nuts behind them and loosely tighten them so that we get the relative position of the bracket. And you're going to see that the innermost edge uh, on the inside of the fender well is going to cross a black factory bracket, what used to mount to the inner fender liner, and that's going to have to be cut off. So we're going to mark that with a Sharpie and simply take one of our cutoff wheels and remove that material. So the whole purpose of this was to get the bracket mock mounted so that we can see where that final hole was going to go. So now we've cut the extra material off. We want to make sure we mark the hole from the top with a Sharpie, and that'll give us some guidelines once the bracket's removed on where to drill. I always like to do a pilot hole, so eighth inch from the bottom, following that immediately with a quarter inch drill, which will be the final hole size for the last bolt that'll go through that bracket. So we're ready to do some paint prep and I'm going to start off with some degreaser and I'm simply going to spray down the area in and around all the things that we've touched. This is to get some of the dirt residue off on the inner fender. This is to get my fingerprints off the outside or any residue left behind by the cutting process. Once we've removed the grease or oils from the surface, I'm going to start laying down my paint edge uh, and I'll be doing that about a quarter inch away from all the exposed metal. And the whole reason why we're doing this is that we've got to get some rust inhibiting paint over the edges that we We've just exposed. This is the inner fender well. This is a spot that's going to get splashed with water and have moisture around it all the time. So this is a critical step to make sure that you're not causing any future damage with an unsealed surface around your painted area. So spend some time, tape it off, make sure you get all the cut edges with some of your rust inhibiting paint, but also tape off the areas you don't want the overspray to. And if you've noticed on the outside of the body panel, I've just got some simple paper towels to manage that. But on the inside of the fender well, I'm not too worried. It's, it's not an exposed area. It's literally going to be covered up by the inner fender. So a little bit of overspray isn't going to hurt anything on the inside. For the rust inhibiting paint, I'm using a Rust-Oleum Satin Black Finish. Basically, I'm going to go on fairly heavily and cover that little quarter inch margin on the outside, make sure I spray between the panels and get all of the exposed edges. I'm going to do a little bit more on the inside, more than I need, but again, you're not going to see it. So I'd rather have too much paint than not enough. Giving the paint some time to dry, go ahead and peel back your tape edge. And this is basically what the area should look like. The closeout bracket is ready to be installed for the final time. Now we need to prep it with all the U-nuts and just follow the instruction guide on which ones to insert from which direction and then line everything up on the vehicle based upon the four holes that we've drilled into the fender. This will be the one hole from the outside of the fender, the two in the bottom, and the fourth that's in the last metal piece that we had to trim and cut. Basically, as you'll see in the uh, video that's going along in the background, I'm loosely placing the nut and bolts together so that they're not so tight that I can't move and adjust the bracket. I wanna make sure that I can get that lined up to all of my cut lines to make a nice even surface before I cinch them down. 
And of course, don't go full torque if you're using an electric device like mine. We don't want to bend the body panels and distort the shape as that's a big part of what's going to make this fit correctly. So here's a look at the final installation and you can see how the bracket lines up to all the cut lines and of course how it looks with all the painted areas. After taking a closer look at the work I've just completed, I noticed that the outer sheet metal deformed more to the heavier inner sheet metal, which left a wavy line on the outside edge. Now, I'm not sure that that's actually going to affect the overall aesthetic, but I did remember reading in the instructions that some trucks will need to use supplied nylon spacers between the inner and outer sheet metal. My kit didn't come with them. I did have these in the garage. They're from my RC car collection of stuff. It's a quarter inch spacer. So I went ahead and installed these. I'm not sure that it's gonna need it, but since it wasn't the instructions and I had some handy, I went ahead and installed them and this is what it looked like. So at this point, it wasn't a whole lot of work. Basically, I had to loosen the four bolts that I put in and take the nuts out and insert the spacers between the two body panels. And the one thing you'll notice is as soon as I loosen the body panel, you'll see that the curve edge relaxes and goes to a more natural position. It's not like this weird double contour. And as you put the spacers in and started to retighten each one, and I just did these one by one, uh, you'll see that basically the fender returns to a more stock-like shape. So what I'm hoping is, is that when I put the uh, closeout plastic panel on it, that it's gonna fit a little better. And that was the end result. So this is something that if you do have those nylon spacers and it says it's optional, spend the extra time to put them in. And honestly, uh, if your truck doesn't need them, I don't know which ones have a different fender that might say that that might not be necessary. But for sure, as you can see, the relaxed version is much more conforming to that original shape. So this is a complete extra credit portion here. This is not in the instructions and is absolutely not required, but because I saw that the little nut insert that was on the bottom here could still possibly be used, I like putting up as many things as I can to keep them from falling down. Uh, I wanted to try to figure out how to use it. So the first thing I had to do uh, is the orientation of this part was 90 degrees clock differently. And I rotated that in order to do that, I had to lop off one of the little ears that helps retain it. The whole purpose of that is that it expands sideways when the screw goes through it to hold it in place. And obviously in the other position, uh, it would be pushing against the plastic and actually would affect the overall fitment. Now, when you're doing that, you do have to modify the, uh, the screw and the washer. And as you can see, I simply cut that. There's two modifications though. You have to cut the washer right up to the edge of the head, but you also have to cut the length off as that uh, closeout plate that we just put in has a overall height that has changed. If you try to use a full length screw, it'll actually push up against the bottom of that closeout plate and push the bottom plastics out the bottom, which is absolutely not what you want from an aesthetic standpoint. So you're gonna have to trim that. So again, this step is something you do not have to do, but it's something I wanted to try to make it work. And in the end it did okay. Next up is the reinstallation of the inner fender liner. Uh, the liner will go in the opposite way as we took it out. So place it back in there, make sure that all of the holes align and that it's formed around all the places it's supposed to. We're gonna cut out some of this material to make it lay flat on the front closeout area. So make sure everything fits pretty snugly before we move on to the next step. So in the next section here, we're gonna do some cutting. And unfortunately, I didn't take my own advice and look at the drawing enough times before I went back to start trimming and I made some assumptions and I did make a mistake here. So do not follow this portion of my cut line. I am gonna show you the appropriate way to do that and I'll show you where to cut in a better way. Unfortunately, the installation guide gives you a 2D picture that doesn't really depict the shape of the inner fender liner correctly. I misinterpreted it and cut it incorrectly here. So in the next sequence, you'll see that it exposes an area that allows for dirt and of course water and moisture to come in. So I do a correction here, as you'll see when I put the plastic inner fender liner back up in the closeout plate, I realize the mistake that I've just made. So don't follow my cut line, wait till after this portion to see how to cut the inner fender liner in order to get the appropriate amount of protection in that area. Regardless of the error I've made in the previous step, the next one is the same for everyone. Here you're gonna line up the inner fender liner against the closeout bracket and make sure that the inside edge and all of the necessary holes are covered. And this is when I first realized that according to the diagram in the instruction book, that that second U-nut should be covered and there should not be a slot behind. Uh, so I went ahead and installed the closeout plastics and saw if I could adjust that with the screws slightly loose moving up and down. And I still had that two millimeter gap, which 
unfortunately it would still allow for debris and material to collect behind it and more importantly water and such so i was able to salvage a chunk of the cut inner fender liner and shape it so that it would fit in from behind and inserted with with it screwed in should hold in place so here I was able to push that from behind and get that onto where that middle U-nut was and screw it into place. And overall, you can see when the panel was uh, readjusted and all the screws put in, the overall finish was not, uh, of course, undesirable. So going back to how it looks like you should cut the material, here's a real life shot versus that 2D diagram like looking shot that's in the instruction manual. Uh, this is what it should look like when you cut it out. This next image is another extra credit step if you want a little bit better fitment on the plastics. Basically what I found was when you uh, sandwiched the inner fender liner because of the curvature between that and the plastic closeout plate, it pushed the edge out. So here I notched around where the bracket goes to the, the actual metal that we've cut and it provided a much flatter uh, sandwiching when that happened and didn't cause the plastic to protrude. So again, this is not in the instruction guide, but I found does help with the overall fitment. So I included that here. So that wraps up about all the metal work we're gonna do. And all we're left with is remounting the factory hardware to put the inner fender liner back in place. Next up, fender flares. Something to take a look at is in the instructions, it looks like uh, the templates have a bit of a problem on mirroring the left and right side. Uh, it looks like they're displaced. So uh, I'll show you what I'm seeing. Here we go. Uh, we just took off the left hand side or driver side, obviously, as can be told by the uh, positioning of where it's hitting. Uh, that's the front of the fender, and this is obviously on the driver's side. Uh, but when you cut out, as you can see, I have not cut out the right hand side ones yet. Uh, cut out the left and you can see this is supposed to be that guideline and obviously it makes it pretty difficult to see your trim lines and such uh, it just looks like it's improperly labeled and since this is a mirror uh, all you've got to do is trim out the opposite side and put it here so mental note uh, take a look at that make sure it's not just a uh, misprint here but I will notify the guys over at AEV uh, but this is definitely a little bit of a complicated problem. Not too bad. Obviously, you can just use this template flipped and pay attention to what the markings are. However, from a safety standpoint, I'm going to go ahead and just use the opposite and mirror clone sides. So here we are. This is actually the one labeled for the right-hand side of the vehicle. And as you can see, it actually lays out exactly like it's supposed to here. So... Uh, just a note, uh, there is a little bit of an error. I don't know if this is corrected, but uh, pay attention to that when you're going to set up your template. So now we have to modify the plastic fender flares and we're gonna need to line up our templates. And as you can see, I didn't wipe this down. So I will use some general degreaser and clean up the plastic so that the template can stick without shifting. Here, we're gonna spend some time and make sure that the template is lined up with all the reference holes. And on that inner kind of hockey stick shape, uh, that matches up to the inner edge of the plastic fender as well as the two hole reference spots. So spend some time, get everything oriented correctly and start laying down your tape to keep it from shifting or moving. Once we get to that spot, it's going to be about creating your do not cut line and that's opposite of the template. The template basically marks the area that's going to be removed and the line I'm gonna be laying down is the line on the outside, which is the material that we're not going to remove. So I'm gonna let this section play a little long. It's gonna be about another two minutes here. So you can see the exact process I go through. A lot of people have commented on my previous video about uh, the process and wanted to see more detail on what I do in transferring that cut line. And of course the process I go through for both cutting as well as uh, sanding down that material. So I'm gonna let this play out and you'll see what I go through in actually laying down my tape lines and making sure that that line looks nice and smooth. So here it is, um, just spend your time on this. To me, this is that step that is what's going to make the finished cut look good. And that's if you spend the time up front to make sure that what you're putting on there is going to be aesthetically appealing. So uh, spend as much time here laying out your template as you're going to spend in sanding and cutting as these two steps are probably the most critical in creating the finished overall look of the closeout and the cut that you're going to make. This stage of the template also requires a little bit of drilling and in this case, it's gonna be on the bottom. Line up your holes, use a center punch. I like to do a pilot hole, especially in the softer plastics before I go to the larger 3 8 diameter. 
in this case it is a slightly larger than 3 8 diameter drill but same concept uh, pilot hole and then final drill with the holes drilled out next we're going to have to line up this template and like the other bottom template this is a fold over template and this will give us our final cut line and basically lay our tape down on that fold line now we're back to cutting and as you can see i'm actually using the very same tool the same cutoff wheel and I'm gonna use the same technique as I did on the metal. I'm gonna stay anywhere from a 16th to an eighth of an inch away, a little bit more on the plastics because again, the heat can cause the plastics to melt and distort. Uh, in addition to that, it flings the material around and makes your cut line harder to see. So if you're going to use a cutoff wheel for this, again, use some caution. This is a device that creates a lot of heat on the surface. And as you see, when I'm cutting through the material, uh, you'll see me wiping and the plastic will be hot so be careful uh, but I'm pulling that plastic away from my cut line so I can see it but also so it doesn't bind up the blade. Unlike cutting the metal the plastic actually moves much quicker so here you're going to see me drop in with the uh, cutoff wheel and remove material a little quicker and as such I'm going to make sure that I leave a lot of space for my sand and finishing uh, versus getting too close to that line. I wanna spend some time here uh, and making sure that the cut line is accurate, but also that when I do the sanding and finishing, I have enough material to get it to where it's completely smooth. Once I reach the corner, I spend a lot more time here and I try to make smaller cuts just to make sure I don't overcut this area. Obviously there's no extra material. The blade will catch into plastics and bite a lot quicker. So spend your time, small cuts, small movements, and make sure you have a nice clean intersection. Uh, once you've got that, you can actually pull the material away. With plastics, unlike the metal, I don't like to bend and twist. It can discolor the plastics, but it can also stretch the material and pull material out that you weren't expecting to come out. So spend your time here, cut all the way through, remove the material you don't want, and get ready to start using the detail sander to come back and remove material. And in this case, you'll see that I use a coarse grit because I left uh, that eighth inch versus 16th of an inch and I'm gonna pull away all of the damaged plastics and the melted plastics first before moving on into the detail sander with a much finer grit. The finer grit sandpaper will allow me to make a much smoother line and an edge that looks less like it's been modified and won't catch your eye as easily. Uh, once I've created that nice sharp edge though, I make sure that the sander cuts in a direction away from the outside so the, the actual sandpaper is rotating towards the inside of where the wheel would be and the tire would be. And I'm using a X-Acto blade to get inside and cut away that extra material. If you sand the opposite direction, you'll be cutting on the outside surface and it leaves a very uneven edge. The X-Acto knife or razor blade is literally being dragged against the edge, not to remove a lot of material, but just to get the debris left by the sanding process. So this is just final finishing. With all of the hard work done, it's time to see how well all of our measurements actually lined up and get the fender flare trial fit against where we put the clothes out. And as you can see, I left all of my tape lines on there. So if I have to make any modifications, everything is still intact. So you don't want to pull that tape off until you're absolutely sure that all the cutting we did is lining up. And as you can see, uh, the instructions have given us some good guidelines. And if you take your time to do the fitment, the fitment is actually really good. So I was extremely satisfied with the first initial fit up that I'm ready to start pulling the tape off and do the final installation on the fender flare and pop all the retainers back into place. With all the retaining clips lined up, I'm gonna go ahead and put pressure on the fender flare and lock it into its final place. Put the final push pin in and a couple of the screws and we're good to go. Looking at the final parts here, this is what you should have removed from the vehicle. This is the actual plastics as well as the inner fender liner scraps and the metal that was removed from both passenger and driver's side. So with the tire back on, you can see the clearance is quite substantial. Uh, if you're looking at the actual part that came off the vehicle, you can see uh, where that material was and that's the part that catches there and we go back the full thickness of that which is a solid inch and an eighth 
uh, to an inch and a quarter um, right off of where the tire makes contact. Uh, I spent my time going through and doing the trim, so it doesn't really catch your eye. Uh, the shininess obviously will go away in time, uh, but the edges are fairly well put together. Uh, just be sure you give yourself some room when you're doing the trim templates. Sand down to the minimums and you'll get a pretty good result, but step back, it's not bad at all.